Have you ever been called out before? Yeah, it's, oftentimes it's in a, a negative light where someone calls you out, they put you on blast and they say, hey, did you just do that? Did you really just say that? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily love when someone would call me out in public and, and kind of just put my stuff out there. I'm not a fan of that. But today, as we look at the text, Paul, he's writing to the church in Thessalonica. He actually calls them out in a good way, in a good manner. For me, I, I was called out in 12th grade. I was sitting in this award ceremony, in this awards chapel, and I definitely didn't think my name was going to get called out. I didn't think I was coming forward for any kind of award that day. So I'm sitting, me and my friend, and we're kind of just hanging. We're, we're chatting, thinking, yeah, we probably got an hour to kill as this award ceremony goes on, as they call all these different names forward for a math award and a science award and an English award for all the different grade levels. And lo and behold, about 30, 40 minutes in, my name gets called out. What? I look at my friend, my, me, my name, really? Yeah, that was me. So I hop up out of my seat, and quite frankly, didn't even really realize what I was getting called up to the front for because I wasn't paying any attention because I wasn't thinking I was getting any kind of, <clears throat> you know, any kind of uh, uh, paper or any kind of um, <clears throat> gratitude for something I've done. But what, did it, what happened? I got an award for having the best grade in my grade for science. Well, I was surprised, I was shocked, and quite frankly, I'm still waiting for them to call me back to say, oh, actually, we made a mistake, we need the paper back, you know, it really wasn't you. But believe it or not, I got this award. I was called out, and it was a, a, one of those good instances. It wasn't like, you know, fifth grade kickball where you're the last one called out from a lined up on the fence where, you know, no one wants to pick you. It was like, yeah, you did something good, Jeff. I was encouraged, I was excited. We see this, this phrase called out. It's got three meanings, three definitions. The first is to draw attention to a specific person or group of people. The second is to draw attention to a specific subject or a specific quality or trait about someone or something. And the third is to summon action or change. So you're, you're, you're calling out maybe a specific person. You're, you're drawing attention to an attribute or a trait. And then third, you're, you're saying, hey, we want to see uh, some sort of action or change take place. As we look at the text today, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 through 3, we see Paul, he, he calls out a specific group of people. He calls out some specific traits. And I believe that he writes this here because he wants to, to elicit or to spur some action on our behalf as well in our lives. Let's read it if you've got your Bible handy. It's 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 3. Verse 1 says this, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and Father. Who's he calling out? He's calling out a group of people there, and, and we see in verse one, he says, to the church of the Thessalonians. That word church there, if you've got your, your pen, I want you to highlight it, underline it. It's the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, ekklesia. And it's simply defined as a group that are called out, they're set apart, they're different. It also means an assembly or gathering. So he's saying, hey, the group that I'm talking to, it's that church in Thessalonica. I'm calling you out, I'm talking to you specifically right now as Paul's writing that letter. And he says, hey, I, I, I've got something for you because you guys are set apart, you're different, your lives are supposed to look different than the rest of the world. You see, it's John 15, 19. I believe this passage of Scripture so clearly defines for us why we're called to be called out and what it looks like to be called out from the world. It's John 15, 19. It says, the world would love you as one of its own belonging to it, but you no longer are part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. You see, we're no longer part of the world, John writes for us. We're no longer part of the, the fashion and the way of the world, the system of the world. God, God is calling us out from darkness into light. First Peter chapter two, verse nine, it says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, 
A holy nation, his own special people. Why? Why have we been called out? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, church, Coast Hills, here's what I believe. God has called us in to a specific geography. God has called us in physically to a certain place. Yeah, for us, it's Orange County. God has called us here. Some of you might know exactly why God's called you here. Others, you might wonder, still be scratching your head thinking, why in the world am I here in Orange County? How did I end up here? As God has called us here, there's a purpose, there's a reason. But spiritually, he's called us out. He's called us to live different than the rest of the world. Why? As it says there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, so that we can proclaim the praises of him who's called us out. You see, it's Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. Jesus, he's making this parallel between people and trees. And he says, hey, if you look at a tree, you can tell what kind of tree it is based on the fruit that that tree bears. You can tell that it's an orange tree because it has oranges. You can tell this is a, an apple tree because it has apples. And he's, he goes on to share, hey, likewise, there's some fruit that should be exhibited in your life if you're a called out one. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of me, he's saying, hey, there should be some things that are evident. So as we spend some time today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 through, 1 through 3, we're going to see some of the fruit that should be displayed, that should be on display for the world to see because we've been called out by him. Our first of three points is this, called out of faithless works to faith that works. We've been called out of faithless works to faith that works. You see, faithless works have no value and no power in God's economy. If there's not faith attached to the works that we're doing, it means absolutely nothing in God's economy. It has absolutely no power in God's economy. You see, many of you might have grown up in a, in a flavor of faith that says, if you do for God, if you give to God, then surely, certainly, you'll find yourself in heaven. If you, if you do enough things, if you give enough money, if you serve enough, if you say enough prayers, then yeah, the, the scales will be evened out as maybe the flavor of faith that you might have grown up in. And God is saying, hey, that's not the case at all. It's not about what you do. It's not about what you give. Quite frankly, God wants all of your heart. You see, good deeds and time and money given have no value to God if it's not done with a heart that's faith-filled for him. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. If you have your Bible, I want you to flip there real quick with me. It tells us of a story about works that aren't done in faith. It tells us about how they have absolutely no value if we do these works without faith in God. Luke chapter 18, verse 9, I'm going to read it for us. It says this, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and another a tax collector. The Pharisee stood, prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like this other men, extorters, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes and all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we've got two guys. We've got a Pharisee, and we've got a tax collector. And everybody in Jerusalem thought that the tax collectors, they were the worst of the worst. They were traitors, you see. They've, they, they were working for the Roman government, collecting taxes and tribute from the, from the Jewish people and giving it and sending it back to Rome. So no one liked tax collectors, kind of like today, right? Uh, no one likes paying taxes. But this Pharisee says, yeah, I, I'm not like him. I've been living my life by the letter of the law, doing everything that I'm supposed to do. I follow you, God. Not only do I do everything I'm supposed to, but I fast twice a week. I give tithes on everything that I have. But what do we see? Jesus says, he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, referring to the tax collector. 
because there's this humility that he had versus the Pharisee, he trusted in himself thinking that he was made right and righteous by the works that he had done. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how hard we work for God. It doesn't matter how much we give to God. If it's done without faith, God is saying, hey, I want nothing. I want nothing to do with it. I want no part of it. You see, it reminds me, just this past week, my son uh, this year is starting school. He's in junior kindergarten. And as he's in junior kindergarten, he uh, was in class and uh, he's got these two, two buddies. Uh, one is Dougie and the other one's Max. And Dougie came to, to class one day last week with some lollipops. And Timothy sees these lollipops, right? And like any of us, we want a lollipop, right? My buddy's got a lollipop and, and, and Dougie starts to, to dole out these lollipops. He's starting to hand them out. And there's no more lollipops and Timothy, my son, didn't get one. And so I asked my boy, as I was bringing him home that day, I said, hey, so how was your day? Tell me about your day. And he tells me about how Dougie gave lollipops to Max and all these other kids, uh, but he didn't get one. And so Timothy said, tomorrow, here's what I'm gonna do, Dad. I'm gonna take Dougie, one of my favorite cars, and I'm gonna give it to him. And then, hopefully, the next day, he'll bring me a lollipop, and I'll get a lollipop from him because I give him one of my favorite cars, so surely he'll then give me a lollipop, right? And now my heart broke as a dad thinking, I'm so sad that he didn't get a lollipop and that he's kind of working through this at a young age. Now, it's probably good for him, right, you know, to kind of experience a little rejection, uh, you know, at a young age. But the truth of the matter is, he's kind of thinking, like this Pharisee here where, well, if I, if I give Dougie a car, then, then certainly I'll get something in return. And the Pharisee is thinking, well, certainly if, if I give God all my time and all my money, then I'll get, a, uh, certainly God will have to allow me to come into to heaven. Certainly I'll then be granted opportunity to go into heaven. And how often do we kind of live with that mentality of thinking if I do for God, if I give to God, then he'll have to let me in. And I want to tell you that there's not an amount of things that you can give or amount of things that you can do that will justify you to find your place in heaven. You see, it's not about what we've given or the time that we've spent serving him. He desires an obedient heart. He simply wants your heart. It's Matthew chapter 17, verse 19 through 20. There's a story that that Jesus tells about, about a dad who brings his son and this, this boy, he's, he's demon-possessed. He's got, he's got a, a demon that he's possessed by, and, and the dad, he brings his son to the disciples, and he says, hey, can, can you heal him? Can you cast this demon out? And what do we know as we, as we read the story? The disciples, they, they try, they pray, they, they try to do it, and, and, and nothing happens. No change takes place. And so as we see here in verse 19, the disciples kind of sheepishly with their tail between their legs make their way back to Jesus after Jesus has now healed the boy and cast out the demon. And and here's what they say, verse 19 of Matthew chapter 17. It says, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. You see, the disciples, they were doing something good. They were doing something holy and wholesome, but we can be doing all the right things, even with all the right motives, but if we don't truly believe that God can do something, what's it say here? What happened with the disciples? It didn't happen. You see, if we try to do something without faith in God, believing that he's got the power, it's going to be powerless because our power is in God. It's in the Lord that's working it. It's not in in the things that we do or how we perform it. It's not how we go about making it happen. No, it's, it's us believing that God, you are the one that's doing this work right now. You see, we're called to have faith that works Faith that works is powered by the obedience to God. Faith that works are powered by obedience to God. It's James chapter two, verse 14. Here's what it says. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? You see, true faith is more than just saying, yeah, I believe that that Jesus is the son of God and that he died on the cross and, and, and rose from the grave for the sins of the earth. 
No, it's, it's not just saying that. It's not even just believing that. You see, faith that works is powered by obedience to God. I'm gonna continue to read James chapter two, verse 15 through 22. You'll see it on the screen behind me. It's in the New Living Translation I'm gonna read. Here's what it says. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a great day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith and others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Verse 19, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. It says there, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. You see, Jesus, he's the Lord of our life. He's the Lord of our life, and we are his servants. And so if he is the Lord of our life and we are his servants, he's commanded us, he's called and commanded us to do two things. He's called and commanded us to take up our cross daily and to glorify him through our lives. We've got to take up our cross daily to live for him and then to make his, known, his name known, to glorify him through our lives. Thus, the, the works in our lives are not just simply us doing something, but it's a response to that understanding that he is the Lord of my life. And he is the one that all blessings come from in my life. And he is the one that the grace that I walk in each and every day comes from him. You see, he desires faith that works. Let me remind you, the Lord wants our heart. He wants all of our heart. He doesn't want just a piece of it. He doesn't want to share it all with anybody else or anything else. But likewise, he wants us to live for him. And as we fully surrender our heart to him, those works will come. Those works will, will be fully devoted and fully committed to him. Our second of three points is this today. We've been called out of laboring and lusting to laboring in love. We've been called out of laboring and lusting to laboring in love. Apart from him, we labor in lust for ourselves. Apart from our relationship with Jesus, all we care about is ourselves. I guarantee you, the first thing you do in the morning, you wake up, your eyes pop open, what do you think about? Yourself. Man, I'm still tired. Man, I gotta go get that cup of coffee. Man, I'm hungry. I barely ate anything last night. I've gotta go get that omelet. What is it? You see, as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a, a song that many uh, famous musicians have sung from Elvis Presley to Willie Nelson, but it was made famous in 1982 by Willie Nelson. It was a song that it kind of went like this. You're always on my mind, right? You guys know that song? Well, here's what I believe. That song is probably more well written of I'm always on my mind because it was a love song written to someone else, but quite frankly, we love ourselves more than we love anybody else. Okay? Transparent moment. That's the case for me. I think it is for you. And that's the case apart from Christ. From the moment we wake up, all we think about, all we consider to the moment we go to bed is ourself. You see, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. I'm going to read it with you. It says this, And he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, verse three, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You see, it says there, we once, before we came to know God, conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of our mind. All we cared about before coming to know the Lord is ourself, fulfilling the lust and the desires that we have for ourselves. 
There's a list in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 that I think really sum up some things that we should steer clear from. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. For the sake of time, I'm going to give you just some quick definitions of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The first of which is the lust of the flesh. It's that craving, that longing, that desire for things that excite a sensual pleasure in us. It's, hey, I, I, I want that. The lust of the eyes. It's related to, I see something, I want it, I'm going to go get it. It's that craving, that desire of, man, I want it. I'm going to go after it. No matter what it takes, I'm going to go get it. I'm going to make it happen. The last one, the pride of life. Probably one of the hardest ones I think for us to steer clear of. It's, it's that arrogance. It's that pride that says, you see what I just did? Yeah, you can check that out. Yep, that was me. I made that happen. It's that arrogance that says, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look what I've amassed. And we're to steer clear of these three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But man, I'll tell you, it's hard. But with him, we're to labor in love for God and for others. As opposed to, to, to laboring and lusting for ourselves, we're to labor in love for God and for others. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, our home text today, that word labor, it's to toil. It's to work to a point of weariness, to work really, really hard. Now, it was a few weeks ago that Pastor Chet was kind of given a hard time about millennials and how they don't even know what this word means or don't know how to operate in it. I'm not going to go there, but what I will say is I believe that, you know, there was that greatest generation, that World War II generation, that they really do know what this word means, and they work really hard. But I think each and every one of us, we've been called to toil, to labor, to work hard at loving people that are really hard to love. We've all got them. You and I, we've got those people in our lives that are really, really hard to love. It's Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. As we've been called to labor in love God and others, Jesus was asked a question. The question was, hey, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus, this is what he says, it's all about love. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, hey, of all the things that you need to focus on, it's about loving me and about loving others. To labor to love me and to love others. Now, as we labor to love God, it's with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. There's three things I want us to take note of, of how we can do that. The first of which is a steadfast commitment to his word. We labor to have a steadfast commitment to his word, whether it's laboring to rise early in the morning to spend that time with Jesus, to hear from him as we dig into his word. Or maybe for some of you that come to the 1115 service, it's saying, hey, I'm gonna labor to get up 15 minutes earlier so I can get to the 11 a.m. service. Yeah, now I say that and that might hurt a little bit, but I, I, I'm just gonna ask the question. Monday through Friday, as you're at work, Imagine if you were just to kind of squeak into the meeting, run in at the very last moment as the door's closing. Or maybe, better yet, 10 or 15 minutes as the meeting's on its way, you kind of creep in sheepishly, your head down, hopefully nobody sees me, you make your way in. Now, how much of that meeting are you going to be aware of what's going on? Quite frankly, you're going to probably spend the next 15 minutes trying to figure out, okay, where are they at, where are they going, getting caught up. I want to encourage you, labor to be in a place, in a position where you can come in here on Sunday and you're not just squeaking in, but you can come in, you've got your coffee in your hand, you've got your donut. I mean, we make it simple for you guys, right? Uh, but simply this, that you're here hearing from God, that you can leave at the door the distractions, the worries, the cares of the day and hear from God. Your heart's prepared to worship him. Your heart's prepared to study his word as opposed to just getting in, getting caught up, figuring out where we're at and what's going on. As we labor to love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, 
We have a steadfast commitment to his word, but we also labor to, to take time to share with him and to hear from him in our time of prayer. Make sure that you've got time set aside to do that. And third and finally, as we labor to love God, it's, it's being led by the Spirit to take faith-filled steps that he calls you to do. You see, I believe each and every one of us in this room, God has called us to take faith-filled steps, to be called out to do something. God's calling you out. He's saying, hey, you, yeah, you, I want you to do this. But sometimes it's hard to listen to a spirit and say, all right, I'm going to do it. Trust him. He's going to see you through the process. You see, nothing motivates someone to do something more than love. And I believe that as God's called us to labor in love for him and for others, we will do this as we realize, as we understand how much he loves us. You see, God's love for us is so immense. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 6, it says, because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. He says, it says that he loved us so much that we were dead in our trespasses. We were going an opposite way, contrary to who he is and what he wants. And he says, hey, I want to give you life. I want you to experience true life and real life as you walk with me and as you follow me. But I don't want to just give you life. Who's been to a wedding and, and been at the reception, right? There's, there's this table at the front where the bride and groom sit, and then there's all these other, other tables. And there's always, you know, tables up front, and then there's tables in the back. And you know that if you're at the table in the back, it's kind of just common knowledge, if you're at the table in the back, that you really don't know the bride or the groom, right? You know, let's, let's not try to make ourselves feel good about it, but, you know, the people that really know them, the family, they're up front, and Jesus says, hey, I love you so much that I want to give you life and I want you at my table. I want you right next to me. I want you with me. That's how much I love you. And so as we consider that, let's consider that God wants us to, to be purposed, to labor, to love him, and to labor, to love others. You see, in order for us to labor, to love others, we've got to be in community with others. It's Hebrews chapter 10, 24 through 25. It says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhort one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. You see, in order for us to labor with love with others, we must be in relationship with others. We've got to be in relationship with people in order to love people. And I believe that in this age of COVID, it's harder and easier than ever before to be in relationship with people. I believe it's harder and easier. We've got technology, we've got all these great things, but there's also COVID, so it's, it's harder. And here's what I believe. I believe that there's some people that God has called and said, spoke to them very clearly, hey, I want you to walk in wisdom right now in this season, and I want you to remain at home. But here's what I also believe, that in that season, if that's where God's called you, if that's what he's called you to do, Man, I'll tell you, I don't think there's a church on the planet right now that hasn't, you know, popped up some sort of digital media, some sort of digital community. And Coast Hills, we have done the same. There's a life group that meets on Wednesday nights during our, our Wednesday night service. And I'll tell you, it secrets out, but it's probably the best life group out there. Uh, whether it's an in-person or online one, the group that meets it is so cool the way they love each other, the way they encourage each other. Uh, just last week, I was kind of tuning into the group, and literally, they're sharing with each other uh, things that they've learned and grown from each other, uh, and, and just how God has created them uniquely and specifically and sharpened each other in this season. So if you find yourself in this season right now, at home, tuning in online, hey, there's no excuse. Be a part of community so that you can labor to love the people that God's put you in community with, so that you can be sharpened and that you can sharpen others as well. Maybe you are here on site and, and you find yourself maybe not really in community. I wanna challenge you, I wanna encourage you, find yourself in good, godly community with other people so that you can be built up, so that you can be edified. You see, it's uh, Romans chapter 15, verse one and two. We're encouraged and we're reminded that we're to bear the weaknesses of others. We're to bear the weaknesses of others. It says this in Romans 15, verse 1, when we then who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the weak, 
and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to the edification or being built up. You see, we are to labor to love them so that they're built up. We've got to be in community so that we can build others up. And I believe that there's nobody that knows more about laboring to love than moms. Any moms here this morning? Right, we've got a few moms. There's nobody on the planet that knows more about laboring to love someone than a mom. Right, I I don't think they call it labor and delivery for no reason. Because like labor in and of itself, like it's hard work. We talked about what that definition of that word means. I remember being there as my wife, and and I don't know firsthand, right? But I I was there uh, as my wife had three kids but that's just the beginning. It's the late nights, the early mornings that turn into long afternoons as you feed, as you burp the baby, as you then have the baby spit up on you, as you then change the diaper. You are laboring to love this child. And what does the child do for you? They scream at you. Yeah, they cry, right? And Jesus, he's called us to labor to love people. And I believe that God's put people in our lives that he's saying, hey, I want you to labor to love them. And it's going to be just like when you labor to love someone that's tough to love. I'm not going to say unlovable because God's called us to love them. He's saying, hey, I want you to labor to love them. It was just this week, me and my wife were talking about how God's put people in our life, that he's given us a a position and an opportunity to speak into their lives. And sometimes, quite honestly, we're hesitant to say something because we don't want to get thrown up on. We don't want to get spit up on and, and them to say, oh, you don't like me. I'm offended. I'm never going to talk to you again because we enjoy relationship with people. But God's put you in relationship with them so that you can edify them, so that you could see them grow, so that they can be spurred on. Let's purpose to get messy in life as we labor to love people. Our third and final point is this. We've been called out of hopelessness into hope. We've been called out of hopelessness into hope. You see, without the hope of Christ, we are hopeless. Without a relationship with Jesus, there's nothing on the planet that is worth living for. There's nothing on the planet that's worth looking forward to without a relationship in Jesus. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Romans 6, 20 through 21 and 23 says this, When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. You see in verse 21, there's a phrase eternal doom. Verse 23, the word death. The writer is simply trying to tell us that we will be eternally separated from God and eternally separated from anything that's good, anything that's pleasing, without a relationship with Jesus. Without the hope of Christ, there is no hope. You see, but with the hope of Christ, we can endure all sorts of trials. The the church in Thessalonica, as this letter was written, they were facing all sorts of trials. They were being persecuted for their faith. Here's a reminder, here's an encouragement we have. Psalm 27, verse 14, it says, wait on the Lord and be of courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And I I love how the psalmist, he kind of goes back around and just sums it up. He says, wait, comma, I say, pause, think, remember, ruminate, chew on it, on the Lord. Wait on him. Don't wait on what you can figure out, what you can make happen. Wait on the Lord. You see, as a church, as his people, as the church in Thessalonica, they were being called to look forward to what's to come to that time when we are spending eternity with Jesus as opposed to having our our focus and our mindset on our daily difficulties and the worries of the day. No, yeah, that's not where God wants our focus. He wants our focus to be on the calling that he's given us of making his name known and to remember that he's given us the Holy Spirit, the helper, right? Jesus is parting words to us, Acts chapter one, verse eight. He says, hey, gang, I'm leaving, I'm heading out but I'm going to give you the helper, the Holy Spirit. And so when I go, you can call into him. He's here to help you as you are my witnesses around the world. We have hope in him as we trust in him. So for some of us here, we find ourselves in a place, we find ourselves in a position that we've trusted God. We've committed our lives to him. And and I, I want to remind you that you've been called out. 
You've been called to live a life that's set apart, that's different, to walk in light and no longer in darkness. So let's walk worthy of the manner in which we've been called. The works of faith, yeah, the works should be that response to our understanding that God is the Lord of our life and all good things come from him. Remember, he wants your heart and as he has your heart and as you realize how much he loves you, the things that we do will be done for him and through him. Labors of love, he wants you to labor in love for him and for others. Seek him with your whole heart through prayer, through his word, trusting him. Be in community as you labor to love others. And hey, get ready. You're going to get messy. It's going to get messy. You're going to get spit up on. You're going to get thrown up on. But it's about being loving and laboring to love those that God's put in your life. Endurance of hope. You see, I want to remind you that you're not doing life alone. As, as you've committed and, and, and said, hey, I'm, I'm called out. I'm, I'm one of God's followers. I'm following him you can call out on the Spirit, and he will be there with you. He's your helper. Live in the hope to come, not in the worries of today. Now, there might be someone here today that, that maybe you say, yeah, I, I haven't experienced the hope, the love, the faith of walking with Jesus. I haven't made that decision. I haven't made that commitment before. Well, in just a moment, the, the prayer counselors are going to come forward, and, and whether you've made that commitment and you say, hey, I, I need just to hit the restart button, and I, I want to pray for the Spirit to fill me, or maybe you say, I've never made that decision, and, and I want to walk with Jesus from the first time today until forever, because I've made a royal mess of my life. Jesus says, hey, I, I want you to put your faith in me. I want you to trust me with all of your heart. I want you to experience the love that Jesus has for you. You see, the Spirit of God wants you to experience the hope that you will only have in him. One of my favorite verses, it's this, Romans 15, 13, it says, may the God of all joy and hope give you peace as you trust in him. You see, it's all predicated on us trusting in him. The God of all joy, hope, and peace. See, if you haven't experienced that joy, that hope, and that peace that God and he alone can give, let today be that day.